than you. <laughs> and also for you, it can be a repetition, but hopefully it may not be a repetition. Um, because um, when I call and ask our brother Joe, he said, okay, I'm not the same thing. Can pick whatever message, uh, try to be in the, in the uh, in relevant to the theme. That's what he asked me. So what I was thinking is, I was looking at this chapter, the Ephesians 50 chapter, and then, okay, I know uh, there are designated official pastors like Pastor Maveen and Pastor Raj Kumar, and they must be preaching, so let me go away from the main verse, 5 2. And then I thought I would focus on 5 verses 15, 16, and 17. Those are the three, three verses that I wanted to focus. But lo and behold, as I heard from Pastor Navi this morning, I thought you would definitely keep the passage in tomorrow, maybe. Uh, if not tonight. So, uh, I, uh, so but, but it could be. I think I have the privilege of going first, you see. <laughs> so that is the advantage that I have. When you go first, yeah, you at least you have a floor is clean. <laughs> so uh, for here it become a little bit, and maybe you may have modified a little bit, or you may exactly repeat the same thing. So let us, uh, if you don't mind, you can stand and then let us repeat this in verses. Ephesians of 5th chapter, verses 15, 16, and 17. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let us pray. Mm -hmm. Gracious God, what a wonderful God you are. Thank you for bringing all of us like this to this conference. And also, Lord, you are continuing to speak to us. We thank you. So far, we heard two wonderful sermons. Lord, thank you for using your servant. Lord, as we are going to look at these three verses now, please, Lord, hiding behind the cross, I am totally unworthy. Lord, to speak and to preach on your holy word. So, Lord God, please, Grant us your presence and speak to each one of us, including me. In Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Recently, I came across a story of a British man, and this person was a burglar, house burglar. This really happened in 2009 in Wales, in British England. What happened was this man, actually somehow, he was involved in house robbery and then the police were seeking to capture this man. And he was some person who was known to the police, so they had a mug shot of this person and then they actually printed a mug, mug shot in the newspaper and they were trying to seek public help to capture this man. And when that mug shot appeared in the newspaper, this man, the actual criminal or the actual robber was so unhappy. Oh, this shot was not looking good. Why don't they do something? So he went there and stood in front of the police van and took a picture of himself and then he sent that to the same newspaper and asked them to publish it. <laughs> And then they published, they obliged his request and they published it. And lo and behold, soon he was captured. What do you think of that? That is called utter foolishness. Lack of sense. Anybody who has a sense would not do that. Why would you jeopardize yourself and then and provide the information so that they would come and capture you? with more information, right? That's exactly how we think of what foolishness is. The Webster Dictionary actually defines foolish as this, a person who lacks judgment or sense. That is how we also think foolishness means. But that is not how 
God thinks. That is not how Bible says what foolishness means. Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Oh, that person is the actual fool. Psalm 74 verse 22, there it says, Arise, O God, plead your own case. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you all day long. A foolish man is someone who not only denies the existence of God, but also he keeps on reproaching God. Psalm Proverbs 14, 9 says, Fools mock at sin. Oh, this is the foolish man. Fools mock at sin. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. You know, tell me other things, then what do you think? Yeah. The bunny that I catch it has only three legs. That's it. It cannot have four legs. Yeah, that is a fool. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Bottom line, a fool is somebody who denies, either he denies the existence of God or he lives in such a way that there is no God. He may not say openly with his mouth that there is no God, but his actions, his deeds, and everything reflect an attitude that there is no God. That person is a fool, not like a Matthew Maynard that we see in the British newspaper. Maybe he is in our sense, but in the sense of God, everything is about the attitude and the recognition of God, God's commands, and God's existence, God's demands in a person's life. One more other verse that we share before I get in. Proverbs 1 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Then it continues. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Oh, that is the beautiful characteristic of a fool. He did deny the wisdom and also they deny the instruction. The elders of this demon group have wisely selected this beautiful book, the Ephesian book, Ephesians Gospel, uh, the letter to the Ephesians. We know in the first three chapters of Apostle, Paul gives a beautiful explanation of the doctrine, the doctrine of salvation, we know the role, roles of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the first chapter, and then followed by, and then he says how we are saved by faith alone, we were dead in our trespasses in second chapter, and then he talks about the mystery of the gospel, and how the Jewish people and the Gentile people were brought together by the great mystery of this is salvation. He gives the beautiful explanation about our position in Christ and also our possession in Christ. And see, you are here in the sight of God. Then, after all those three chapters, then starting from fourth chapter onwards, four, five, and six, he gives, but you are here physically. Your position is here, but you are here physically. You have to go up in order to match to your privileges in order to match your position in the God. And that is that, that is a practical explanation, practical life. That's why he begins the fourth chapter. Live, walk in such a way that you have to, it should be according to the worthy of your calling. It's a beautiful verse. Walk in a manner worthy of calling with which you have been called. That is the main heading. That is the three words of the last three chapters. Chapter 4, chapter 5, and in chapter 6, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. What is that? What does that mean? Walking in a manner worthy of your calling is what? So, it is like a balance where you put on one side villages, and in India, on one side you put the weights, half kg, one kg. On the other side, you put vegetables, right? And then they balance it out in the same way. Imagine the balance. Hold it like this. On one side, you put the character and the characteristics and the qualities of Jesus Christ on one side. 
on the other side, you put your own characteristics and see how well this balance is there. God is called exactly walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And keeping that as the main theme was, and then he begins to give a lot more details. The practical implications of that walking. And what are those implications? He says, walk in unity. Fourth chapter, verses 2-16. through 16. Walk in unity. Then he says, walk in the newness of your life. That is the fourth chapter, verses 17-24. to Then walk in love. That's what our pastor told today. And then walk in sexual purity. And what I am addressing is the last one. Walk in biblical wisdom. Okay. These are the practical implications. And this last portion, of course we have the last one, everybody knows, the order of God, I'm not going there. Okay. Before that, the last section is by walking in biblical wisdom, which starts from 15th, 515, and it goes all the way through 6 9. But I don't, I don't have time to unpack all this last section. That's why I'm just focusing on three verses. Okay? The three verses which we read, 15, 550 chapter, 15, 16, and 17. What is the theme? What is the purpose of this sermon? My, the purpose of my sermon is for all of us to live a life of biblical wisdom. That is the purpose of this sermon. For all of us to live a life of biblical wisdom. Not as unwise men, but as wise men. That is the purpose of this sermon. And then, Apostle Paul gives us three requirements in these three verses. I am giving you the plural noun proposition right now. There are three requirements in order to achieve the purpose. And those three purposes are, 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 are I'm going to unpack those three requirements rather. Those three requirements to have that kind of purpose. Number one, if you want to write down, I'm going to unpack each one of them. Number one, be cautious about your ways. In other words, examine your ways. That's what we are going to see in verse 15. Then the second, redeem your time well. In other words, seize every opportunity that comes in your way. That is the second requirement. The third requirement is understand God's will, which is set on verse 17. So those are the three requirements. I have clearly stated before you the purpose of my sermon, I also clearly stated before you the plural noun propositions, in other words, the three requirements in order to achieve that purpose. Now, let me try to unpack each one of them. Let us look at the first requirement. The first requirement to live a life of biblical wisdom, or the first requirement to walk as wise people, is be cautious about your ways. Be careful. And the Greek word we say is blepete. Um, blepete, that is actually blepo, is a verb. That blepo means see, to look. In other words, seeing. Basically, Paul is saying, watch out, look out, take heed. In this context, what he is saying, what Paul is saying is to contemplate, to think about, to think about your ways, about your ways, to think about, to contemplate, to examine. To weigh carefully how you walk. What is the contemplation? What is the fear do? How you walk. This actually reminds me of my childhood days. Actually, I'm from an agricultural background. Went to Telugu medium schools. Never went to English medium. All my high school, up to high school, up to 10th grade. Everything I did in Telugu medium. And then I was living in village. And so, because of that, I had to go to the paddy fields, even during the rainy season. You know, all the season, because of we had agricultural land and we had to go, go there. So, I was going 
And I remember a certain time when I had to cross canals. You know, in India we had not big canals, okay, not like a big rivers, but the small canals. The, the, the water comes for the paddy fields, right? Sometimes what happens is in order to cross these rivers or these canals, what they used to do is they used to put some kind of a log. That log can be a circular, either they just cut a tree, like a coconut tree or something, they cut the trunk of the tree and they just lay it on, on, the, on the canal so that people can walk. But imagine it is circular and during the rainy season it could be very slippery. If you have to cross the canal, you have to walk over that, imagine how you have to walk. Ah, very carefully, you have to walk down. You make a small mistake, there you are going to be in the water. You cannot make you cannot make that mistake. That's what to contemplate, to think about, to very carefully crossing the canal. Yeah, the way that we cross the canal, you have to be careful. In a similar way, we need to keep a watch over our life on the principles by which we regulate our lives. On the principles, those are the principles, the principles on which we regulate our lives. King Solomon makes a point. He says, you know what? In Ecclesiastes, second chapter, verse 14, he says, the wise man's eyes are in head. Yeah, everybody's had eyes in head. Where, what else do we have heads? In other words, what he's saying is, an unwise man's eyes are not on head, in their head. That's what it means. The wise man's eyes are in head. That means they look out. Always a wise person's eyes always keep looking out. They will always be very, very careful. Seeing his path. He is observant. He is always seeing. But whereas an unwise person, he doesn't see. He walks in the darkness and he stumbles and he falls down. Do not be like that. Imagine we are, we obviously drive on the highway, right? What do we do? Because our internal combustion engine still, okay, I'm not talking about EVs though, by the way. No, I'm not talking about Tesla. I'm not talking about any EVs. On the regular cars, when we, when we drive, our hands are always on the steering wheel. Imagine a situation that you just, just remove your hands from the steering wheel for 10 seconds. For 10 seconds, you just remove. Your car with a brand new car. Just imagine, remove your hands from the steering wheel and keep it driving. What will happen? Either you go on the left side and hit, or you go on the right side and go into the, some kind of ditch uh, or something. What do you call that? Careful. Be careful. You are always, you have to be very careful. Proverbs 14, verse 8. The wisdom of a sensible is to understand his way. The foolishness of fools is a deceit. Again, he is using the word to understand. That means to consider, to give thought. Sometimes to meditate. It also means to meditate. Okay. That is another important word. It to meditate, consider, meditate. All of you, have you got the name John Stott? John Stott. John Stott is a very famous uh, Anglican and uh, a British preacher, he recently passed away, basically means probably maybe 10 years ago, he might have pre passed away. And a great man who wrote many books, he, even, he wrote books on preaching, and one of the great books that I really enjoy is Between Two Words. If you get a chance to buy that book and read, Between Two Words. And he says like this, everything worth doing requires care. We all take trouble over the things that matter to us, our job, our education, our home, our family, our hobbies, our dress and our looks, everything. So as Christians, we must take trouble over Christian life. We must treat it as a serious thing. We must treat it as a serious thing. So that we have, now I'm coming to the application for this first point. Application is this. How do we take Christian life as a serious thing? How can we be cautious about our ways? How practically do we examine our ways? If we have to really know the answer for this question, you know, where we have to turn to? The 
book of James. James is the beautiful passage. James, the first chapter, verse 21 through 23. There he clearly is giving us the answer to the question. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls, but prove yourselves of doers of word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his own natural face in a mirror. He is clearly giving us the prescription for us on how we have to take our Christian life very seriously. Yeah. Basically what he says is in four steps I can tell you. Number one, set aside time. Okay. Set aside time. Number two, study God's word. Not reading, study, study God's word. Number three, meditate upon it. Number three, four, apply God's word in your life. When I was in India many years ago, and during the days of my conversion, I became a believer in Jesus Christ. I came from a Hindu background, and then at the age of 16, I became a believer in Jesus Christ. But during those earlier days, when I was in the 20s, I used to hear a man called Pastor T. John from Hebron in Hyderabad. And then he later on, he moved to Bangalore, and he used to live in Bangalore, he used to come on the radio. And you know what people used to call him as? Walking Bible. And since yesterday I'm seeing another man. Pastor <laughs> Nabi <laughs> as another walking Bible. At least I heard about Pastor Jijan, but actually I'm seeing, I'm having a privilege of seeing a person who is really a walking Bible. If we carefully consider him, for him to reach this kind of a level of expertise, and, and, and the fluency of God's word, imagine how much effort he may have put into. You can never become holy on a single day. You can never become an expert on a single day. You can have a strong desire, but you cannot. That's exactly what you see. Set aside time, study God's word regularly, meditate upon it and apply it in your life. That is exactly what we are seeing here. Not only what we, I know what I do every year. On January 1st, I go to Dillard's. Because in the Dillard's there is a store called Ralph Lauren. I only go once a year for my, to buy my shirts. That is on the January 1st. Why? Because on January 1st, there is going to be a sale, 40% sale on Ralph Lauren shirts, polo shirts. Because of that reason, I only go one day and buy maybe two or three shirts and that's it. And I don't go at all, entire year. Maybe I may buy one jeans, that's it, done. What I do when I go and I see so many shirts there, and so many things on sale, and then I pick them, oh, this looks good, this looks good, this color looks good, this color looks good. Ah, uh, this is the full hands, these are short hands, everything looks good. I pick some tan shirts and then they say, oh, there is a fitting room, you can go and try them on. I go there and I put them on and try them on. Oh my, when I looked outside, they looked so beautiful, but I went, in, went inside and put them on. Out of ten, you know how many I come out with? Two or one. Two or one, that's it. That's all. Our skin color, our hair color, our <laughs> hair, and so many colors are matching and contrasting. And then you end up with just one or two. Yeah, that's exactly what and why. Because there is a mirror inside. Not one mirror, multiple mirrors in the fitting room. If you can see from different angles how you look. Your physical reflection you can watch and see and decide. And this book, dear friends, this book is that mirror. Yeah. This book is that mirror. When you stand before it, what you see, you will see your spiritual reflection. 
And they can understand where you stand before God. And giving another metaphor, it is like a straight plumb line. You know, any builder, he always uses plumb line. And then he, keep, he takes the plumb line and keeps it next to the wall. Then you can see if the wall that he is building is straight or just leaning inside a little bit. And the same thing. That's exactly the same thing. We also need to be always in the Word of God. There is no other way. Word of God. Four things I tell you. Set aside time. Okay? Set aside time. Study God's Word regularly. Not reading, studying. Meditate upon it. Fourth, apply it in your life. That is the first one. That is the first requirement. What is that I said? Be cautious about your ways. Examine your life and see how you are doing. Number two. The second requirement to live a life of a biblical wisdom. Second requirement to live a life of a biblical wisdom is redeem your time well. Redeem your time well. Basically, my version, I love NLC. I don't know who, but some of you um, are familiar. I, I love, really, I love NLC. You know, I understand why. But I went to my seminary. My professors uh, who live in Greek, okay? They actually live in Greek. They are 2,000 year old, okay? Oh, they live in Greek. And uh, they said, okay, if you want to be a pastor, you better be in NLC. And ever since. I have been an NSV. And it says like this, making the most of your time because the days are evil. That's the second requirement. Make the most of your time. First one is examine your walk. The second one is make most of your time. This word, making most of your time, making making the most of is just one word in the Greek, la Greek language. Just one word. Basically, it means redeem. <clears throat> Imagine there is a bank that credits you. They, uh, that credits in your account every morning with eighty-six thousand four hundred dollars every morning. And then it is up to you to go and withdraw that money. If you don't withdraw that money, that money is deleted. And next day morning, under 86,400 is going to be deposited. And that's how the days go. If you don't, they are going to be deleted. What would I do? What would you do? You go and withdraw until the last penny. What would I do? I go and invest in stocks. Right? That's why if you have extra cash, what do you do? You don't keep it in the house. Nobody gives you have inflation running at 8.5%. And it's a foolishness to keep it in the house or in the, in the CV. All that you have is one option. Either you put it in real estate or you put it in stocks. That's all. Any wise person would do that. Imagine. I'm just changing a little bit. Now you have a bank called time. In that bank, you also have an account every day. 86,600 minutes are going to be deposited. Okay? Those, they are going to be deposited. Every second, not minute, sorry. 86,400 seconds are going to be deposited every day. And every night, it writes off. If you don't hit the draw, the, uh, the, the leftover is going to be right off, uh, written off. In other words, they are going to be burnt off. All the unused ones, all the ones that are not used for a good purpose, the time that is not used for the good purpose, for the right purpose, according to the mind of God, and all that is going to be born. And it carries no balance. There are actually two words for this word time, two Greek words for the word time. Okay? One is chronos. Chronos, you get the word chronology, right? And another word is kairos. Chronos is like every successive moment, like a clock. 
second, first second, second second, third second. Matthew's second chapter verse seven. When Herod asked the man, like in the same way, that is the window opportunity, and that is also given as time. And what we are seeing in this passage is not chronos. It's not a successive seconds. But what we are seeing is is kairos. Kairos means windows of opportunities. Right now we are all here. What is it we have to do? We have to the best use of our time. We have the best use of our opportunities to learn about God's word. Right? The same way. That is exactly what we are talking here. Best use of the time. Making the most of your time, making the most of your opportunity. In other words, snap up every opportunity here. Go to the marketplace, give your time, and buy. I'm talking about the bathroom system. Right? You give something, you pay the cash, you know, you go to a pawn shop. I know Indians don't go to a pawn shop. No Indian goes to a pawn shop, right? <laughs> nobody goes to a pawn shop. What do they do? They go to a pawn shop. Many people go to a pawn shop. And then they, they give away their unused watch and you get some few dollars. That is called box. Not buy. Buy. You give it away and then you are buying something. What? You are buying money. In the same way, you have so much time, you just spend that time, you give away the time, but you have to buy something. With your time, you have to buy opportunity. Opportunity for what? Opportunity to live a life that is acceptable to God. That is what exactly what we do. Why he is giving that because the days are evil. You don't know when your time is going to be completed. So because the days are we are surrounded by the foolishness of the world under the control of the gods of this world are the Satan himself. We are always surrounded by this the devil, the Satan. That's when Psalm 90, verse 12, the great prophet Moses, and he writes, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our heart unto this Teach us. So in the light of the brevity of our lives in this earth, in the light of the eternity that we are going to have once we reach heaven, how are we spending our time how are we making the best use of opportunities? That's what we have to do. We have to be careful. We can't keep on spending our time in short-term pleasures or in self-indulgences. But we need to think how we can please our God. Let me come to the application of the second point. The application, how do we make the most of our time? Let me give you some steps. How do we make the most of our time? How do we seize the opportunity in our lives? Step one, develop the right attitude about time. Develop the right attitude about our time. What does that mean? Understand the characteristics of time. Time number one, time is short, James 4.14, Job 9.25-26. to Time is short. Number two, time is a matter of stewardship. That means the time is the gift given by God to you and me. How well we replace it. We think always time is a gift. It is not your own property. God, out of his great mercy, he is giving us time. He is giving us time. Time is a gift. It is a matter of stewardship. Number three, we are accountable to God for our time. Time cannot be stopped. Time cannot be stored, time cannot be stretched. Same time. 24 hours time for our Lord Jesus Christ, 24 hours time for St. Paul, 24 hours time for the President of America. For everyone, it is the same time. And for you and me, it is the same. It cannot be stopped, it cannot be stored, it cannot be stretched. And the bad news is, time flies. The good news is, you are the pilot. Okay. That's exactly what Michael Orchula, the author and the speaker on business leadership, is a very popular man. He actually quoted the phrase, time flies, the bad news is time flies, but the good news is you are a pilot. 
So the first thing is develop the right attitude about a time. Number two, take an inventory of the time, how you spend your own time. You have so many responsibilities, right? Take an inventory. How much time you assign to each activity in your daily life? Take a period of seven days, don't do for one day. Take a period of seven days and then carefully assign your times and how you do that. In fact, uh, when, uh, when I actually joined my PhD program and during that time in the very beginning, one of the exercises that were given to us, all the students, was you have to log your time with 15 minute intervals every day that you do for the entire semester. Every 15 minutes for one semester, you have to log starting from morning 5 o'clock and until you go to bed. Log everything, everything you write down. And then you yourself will find out how much is the wastage. How much is the Tremendous, oh my god, do you used to think, is this how I am spending time? 15 minute intervals. Then, depending on your calling, I told you two things, right? Are you following with me? You're all with me? Yes. Number one, I told you what is that? That was the right attitude. Number two, take the inventory of your time. Number three, depending on your calling, some of us, God calls the pastors or his ministers. Some of you, God will be calling you as singers and the who, who leads the worship. So, uh, some of you, other, other responsibilities. Everyone has a calling. Depending on your calling, identify God-given priorities. Okay? Careful. I am mean, using these words very carefully. Identify God-given priorities. Depending, they are always related to your calling. That is the step number three. Step number four. You need to understand one concept. You always spend time on things that are most important. Okay? That is the fundamental principle. You cannot change. You always spend time on things that are important for you. Not for anybody else. Only for you. You cannot change that mindset at all. But now the point is, when God-given priorities, if they become part of your important things or not, is the main thing. If they are not included in important things, obviously you are not going to spend time on them. That's where you have to see. Very carefully, you have to, very carefully, you have to evaluate. What are the most valued things? Always when I say value, remember the word value? Most valued things in the sight of God, your eternity, your future. Most valued things versus most important things. Okay? Try to identify these two things. Most important things is the place where you spend your time. But most valued things are the things that God values more than. If this left hand side of it, your right hand side, yeah, this side things are the part of most important things. If they do not move into this category, into this bucket that you spend, you are wasting your time. You are wasting your time. Yeah, the right the great. Do not waste. Do not waste your life. Identify most valuable things. Identify most important things. Most valuable things are the things that have value in the sight of God. Most important things are the things that you spend your time. Unless the most valued things become part of most important things, you are wasting your life. That's why Jonathan Edwards, everybody knows, Jonathan Edwards is a very famous theologian in the 1700s, 18th century. America produced one of the greatest theologians. And Jonathan Edwards, he, at the age of 20 or 21, he actually wrote resolutions. Okay? He wrote 70 resolutions. After one year of his conversion, he wrote resolutions. 70 of them. And you know one of them? In 1723, he wrote this, 
resolved because in those days that was a popular practice. All great men, they used to write resolutions. One of them is resolved never to lose, lose one moment of time, but improve it the most profitable way I possibly can. Never to lose one moment of this. Actually, when I came to know about this, this actually impacted me so much. My own life, my personal life. And this became almost like a driving force for me to resign my job. I was working in IT industry. I worked many years in IT industry. It actually it was a driving me because God was clearly indicating to me that I have to come to full time ministry. And then, you know, what was driving me the main thing is if God permits, if I reach at the age 70, if at all, God permits, if I reach 70, when I look back, I should not regret. All that I'm looking at from one thing, well done my faith and salt. That one path. All that I'm carrying was that one path for the Savior. And Stephen, when Stephen was martyr, as we see in Acts, when he was giving up his soul to the Lord, what did he see? Jesus standing and receiving him. What a great picture that is. What about you and what about me? We, one day we are going to finish our journeys. And on that day, we will be get the path from God. Whether he stands or not, that is a separate subject. But at least, are we going to get a path to go back? Yes, well done, my faith servant. And that's the reason I resigned my job and came into the time ministry. Because I'm looking for that day. I should not regret. I can sit up to 70 to become a liability. <laughs> That's why I'm, I'm putting myself as 70 as a mark at the all If I if I continue to live, what God has uh, his plan. Someone has said, okay, this is important, write down. Someone has said this. Life is too short for everything that you want to do. Life is too short for everything that you want to do. But long enough to do. Everything God wants you to do. Think about that verse. Think about that statement. When God puts something in your heart, God also gives you time. So life is too short for everything you want to do, but long enough to do everything God wants you to do. Okay, so far we have seen two requirements to live a life of biblical wisdom. That the first one is to examine our work, to be cautious about our work. Second one is to redeem our time well or to seize every opportunities that come in our life. Number three, quickly, the last one and then I close. Third one, the third requirement to live a life in the wisdom is to understand God's will. That is, verse 17. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 17, verse 17, understand Again, who is a fool? Remember, I told you in the beginning, who is a foolish person? A person, Proverbs 10, 18. A person who spreads slander is a fool. Somebody who spreads slander is a fool. It's Proverbs 10, 23. He who does wicked things like a sport. You remember what happened in Texas recently? Three days ago, four days ago? Just turned 18, bought the guns, and then went and started shooting little, little kids. Is it a sport? Killing little ones? Fool. Such a person is called fool. He who does wickedness like a sport is a fool. Proverbs 14, 26. He who is careless is a fool. Proverbs 17, 18. He who lacks understanding is a fool. Proverbs 1, 22. Most important. He who despises his son. Such a person is fool. Basically, a foolish person is someone who refuses to acknowledge his dependence on God and acts foolishly and acts presumptuously. That means with pride. My way is the highway, and I don't listen to anyone. I have already decided, and this is the right thing, 
and I don't need to listen from anyone. I am like, the captain of my house. I, I, I don't take any orders from anybody. And I am not accountable to any person. Such person is a fool. But here he is saying, for believers, we, who are believers, he is saying, he is exhorting us to understand his divine will. That's exactly all. He is in Lord's will. He is understanding. He is asking us to understand. The word understand. Don't you know? We already know. God, out of his great mercy, yesterday, our pastor, Nabil, has beautifully explained the whole plan of redemption. Starting from Adam. We all heard that, right? He explained from the beginning, from the nature, human nature, sinful nature, the nature that we inherited from Adam and Eve. Until the, until the act of redemption on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ. We heard all that. Then he explained that we have to make our Lord Jesus Christ. We know God's plan. Right? We know God's plan of salvation. But the point here is to comprehend, to gain insight into it. That's what he's talking here. When he used the word understand, what he is saying is, he is talking about understanding with an eye to do it. That's the part he is talking. With an eye to do it. There should be an action-oriented understanding. That's what he is saying. Not the mental understanding, but the action-oriented understanding. Then the next question comes, then what is the will of God? Then obviously you will be coming to the point when you say that I have to or do something, what is that will of God? When we use the word will of God, you know what comes to our mind? Pastor, tell me whom I should marry. <laughs> is this the right thing to do? Is it the right thing to buy a house now? Or should I wait for another one year? Or is it the right job that I have to take or not? Our mind always, immediately, whenever we use the word the will of God, it always goes to the contemporary issues that we face day in and day out. That is not what we have seen here. That is not. There, there are actually, there are two kinds of wills, okay? In fact, three, but I do not remember the third one, which I already talked about the contemporary issues, the will regarding the contemporary issues. I am not even considering that as the categories. There are only two kinds of categories, maybe. The number one is the God's sovereign will. The God's election, God's predestination. God is the one who does everything. Yesterday, our pastor Navi was telling, he is the one who draws you. Unless he draws you, you cannot come to God because you are spiritually dead. As we see in Ephesians second chapter. And that is the God's sovereign will. He decided everything even before the foundation of the world. Again, that's what we see in Ephesians first chapter, right? In the very beginning that we see that. But what we are seeing here is basically his commands, his laws, his moral law. What he signed with was it is not sovereign law, sovereign will, but it is the moral will. When he says moral will, it means the commands and his laws. What are they? Let me quickly tell you a few of them. First Timothy, second chapter, verse 4. God's will is for you to experience salvation. That is God's will. For every one of you to experience salvation. Number two. Romans 12, chapter, verses 1 and 2. To present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. That is God's will. That means you have to live a life of sanctification. You know that right? three stages? Justification, sanctification, and glorification. You know those three stages of salvation. Salvation has three components. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. We are right in the second phase. Present your bodies as a living and a holy sacrifice. Number three. 1 Peter 2nd chapter verse 13 to submit to human authority submit to government human authority submission number 4 1st Thessalonians 4th chapter verse 3 your sanctification which I have talked about that means living a holy life your sanctification is God's will that is the 4th command 5th one 1st Thessalonians 5th chapter verse 18 for you to live a life of thankfulness Never to cease to give thanks to the Lord. Always be thankful. Always be thankful. Number six, first Peter, chapter four, verses one and two. To suffer 
to suffer in the flesh for the Lord. Even that is God's will. When you face sufferings on account of God, there is God's will. So these are the six ways that we can see that God's will is revealed to us. So Paul is not simply asking us to understand these commands in the New Testament. He's not asking us to understand, but he's asking us actually to live a life that is blameless, to put them into practice and live a life that is blameless. By the way, I just know dodge that, right? When you talk, most of you, the relevant thing on the God's will, whom should I marry? When should I buy a house? Where should I go? Should I take this job? Should I take that job? If you want to know more about the subject, you know it's out of the scope for this for this conference. If you want to know more of, more of, about that, I want to recommend a beautiful book. Okay? And the, the book's name is Decision Making and the Will of God. Decision Making and the Will of God by Gary Friesen. It's a beautiful book. If you want to uh, buy and then read that, and it will be very, very useful. So now I'm coming to the last one, the application. The last point, the application. So, how does God give us this understanding? And understanding that we can live, we can apply this life. How, how do we do this? Please turn with me to Proverbs. Proverbs, the second chapter. Proverbs, the second chapter. And here he says, see in verse 6. Yeah, I'm going to close it. Just one minute, deal with me. Just one minute. I'm just standing between you and the lunch. Sorry. <laughs> just one minute. So. Better you than me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> chapter 2 verse 6 Proverbs chapter 2 verse 6 For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding Now we are clearly told the source of this understanding the source of the knowledge the source of the wisdom Who? The Lord himself is the source He is the one who is the source But then how do I get how do I from the Lord's mouth into my heart and then into my actions? How do I do this? How does this happen? There are some if conditions. We are all computer programmers, we must have to know. If then else, if then else. Okay, if condition is a very popular condition. Okay, if conditions. Okay, let us look at so look, look, look at them from the same chapter, verses 1 through 5. Carefully look at them. Same. I actually intentionally went to verse 6 first, and then I'm going up now. Chapter verses 1 to 5. Look at that. My son, my son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, that is the first come, first if. What is that? You have to underline all the verbs there after the if. There are so many verbs are there. He is saying receive, treasure. Chapter 4, verse, verse 2. Make, incline. If you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding, then comes the second if, or three. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding, verse four, another if. If you seek her as silver and search for her as her hidden treasures, then you will discern the and discover the knowledge of God. Let's pray. Most gracious God, we want to thank you, Lord. Your word is so powerful. It is more powerful than the two ages, so as we see in Hebrews 4th chapter. Lord, please bind us. Help us, Lord, to examine our ways. Help us, O oh Lord, to use our time wisely. Help us, O oh Lord, to comprehend, to understand your perfect will as revealed in your word. We can I to do that so that we may live a life of biblical wisdom that is acceptable in your sight. Please do not leave us, O oh God. If there is anyone who is sitting here today, who is not a believer in you? O oh Lord, would you please speak to him? Would you please reveal yourself to him? Would you please draw him towards you? Would you please, Lord, ignite his heart and make the heart live again? Please, O oh God, no one can stand 
against you. We pray that you are perfectly done our lives. In Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.